This is Abe Freetanzer from Schacke, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with one of my favorite composers, Carter Burwell. Uh, it's great to be speaking with you, Carter. Uh, big fan of your work, especially your recent work on The Morning Show, which is the main reason for our conversation today. Great. It's good to be here. So what attracted you to doing uh, this show with Apple TV Plus? Well, you know, um, one is that for me, it was a novelty. I had never done episodic television at all after, after doing like 30 years of film um, scoring. And I like doing something that's new. Um, I've never drawn to television as a medium, but I, when they sent me the scripts um, about the first, like say five scripts from the first season, I thought it was so smartly written and um, interesting. I, I mean, I really did think it would be fun to, to work on. And, um, and yeah, Carrie, Aaron and Mimi Leader, um, you know, are really smart and interesting and um, and fun to work with. So it's uh, it was basically that they hadn't shot it yet. At the point which I agreed to do it, um, it was based upon the scripts. So how does your approach differ for a TV series uh, as compared with a film? Well, it's. I mean, my approach probably isn't that different, but certainly the process is very different. The biggest problem for me, I'll say, is the biggest difference is that with a film, you know, I am. Um, I don't work on a film till I've, you know, I wouldn't work on just a scene for a film. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I read the whole script and ideally I actually see a rough cut of the whole film. So I know where I'm starting, where I'm going, and I can sort of chart a course of how to get from the beginning to the end. But um, TV, it doesn't really work like that, or I guess episodic television where, you know, each episode is in a way has a beginning and an ending, but the thing is that the ending is really an ending because you, you want everybody to tune in next week. So it's not exactly an ending. And then when you get to the actual ending of the season, um, I didn't even know what that was going to be because I hadn't written the final script when I started. So I couldn't exactly plan how I was going to get there. And you just keep your fingers crossed. I hope all these themes and things that I have in mind are going to work when we get to the end. But then when we get to the end, that also isn't exactly really an end because you don't, is there going to be another season? I don't know, maybe, uh, and we didn't know. Um, so um, it's, that's just very different, not knowing where you're headed. Um, and that's very much the way that television is, for, you know. Um, I kind of learned by the second season here to kind of take it differently, to treat each episode as its own uh, experience. It doesn't exactly have an ending, but it's an experience and I want it to be fulfilling in its own way um, and look at them more that way. But that is very different. Did you, uh, had you heard the main title theme and is that something you tried to sort of work with a little bit in creating your score for the show? No, they, um, they did not have that at all until, uh, until almost the show was done, um, the first season. And uh, so they didn't know they didn't know, for instance, maybe it would be a score, but uh, pretty soon they knew that they wanted a song. They wanted a tune, something, something that wasn't mine, to put it simply. And, um, but no, they didn't know, and I didn't know what it was going to be until basically the first season was, was done. And they also weren't sure if they were going to change it up for the second season. So it's, um, but I was not involved in those decisions. That's a whole other thing. And I feel like this is a show that lends itself to some pretty uh, intense character moments that uh, have a lot of opportunity for music, especially with Alex, Bradley, and Mitch. Is there a particular character you enjoyed uh, writing music for specifically? Um, <laughs> no, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say who my favorites are anyway. But um, they are the they, the ones you've just mentioned. They are all great because they. Um, you know, they all have very clear, you know, characters and they all behave in ways that are consistent with their characters. But um, the result of all this consistent interaction is just often absurd. Um, they often are defeat, it's, it's often self-defeating and they often um, are so self-centered that they don't even see what the hell is going on, <laughs> what, what the effect is of their behavior. Um, and yet they've, they're quite certain they're all the smartest people in the room, right? So um, that's, you know, that's sort of where the humor comes from for me. And, um, I'm, you know, early on, I asked, uh, I guess, uh, Michael Ellenberg and Mimi, you know, why, why they hired me? Because it's not obvious why I would be the right composer for this, since I'm more done, known for a dark humor. But they said, we think there's humor in here. It's just not, not joke humor, 
but we, we feel that there's humor in here and that you will find it and that you will bring it out. So um, I have tried to focus a little bit on finding it where I can, the, the irony of people who think they're really smart, but are often like acting so stupidly. Yeah. And there are also some more serious subjects like uh, fires and, you know, sexual assault. And of course, the pandemic in season two that, you know, there I remember a lot of scenes, especially in season two of just sort of seeing things and then you just you hear some music. So was that an uh, exciting opportunity to be able to uh, score these sort of historical uh, current events? Oh, absolutely. It really is. It's nice. One of the things that happens in the show um, not on every episode, but like I said, it'll occasionally, you know, it's, it's very um, insular, the storyline a lot of the time, you're basically in the UBA or the T, uh, TMS, you know, um, uh, floor of that building, and you sometimes just don't feel like you're never going to leave, or you just go to someone's apartment, then you're back in there again, because all they do is go home and sleep and come back in again, and then every once in a while, it opens up and you go, like you say, to California where there are wildfires in the first season or to Wuhan, you know, in the second season. And um, I love with music being able to change that change of perspective, take it from these very um, tight, you know, small ensembles, usually a lot of it's sort of this little piano, upright bass percussion ensemble, and then suddenly make it much bigger um, musically. Um, that, that's very nice and enjoyable to, um, you know, to have those shifts. And I know you said you won't reveal your favorite characters. Do you have a favorite track that you've composed for the show? Ooh, um, yeah, you know, there was one, yeah, it's gonna sound like maybe an odd choice, but I think one of my favorites was I, in the first season when Hannah Schoenfeld, she's, she's come back from uh, Las Vegas where she had this very um, you know, devastating experience with um, Steve Carell's character. And, um, uh, she decides to go and actually report it. And it's a lot of it's her decision is sort of shot in slow motion and in slow motion, she gets into the elevator. We don't know, except, you know, she hasn't said what she's doing, but it is shot in such a way that I think we can sort of get an inkling maybe. And then my goal, goal with the music was to make it clear that yes, this is a, she's made a decision. We haven't seen anybody do this before and um, to go up, to the the corporate floor um we just haven't seen um that happen and um i wrote this piece in seven eight that i it's mostly i think it's all all electronic very different than what we've been hearing in the show until then but i like it because it is just so completely different it just tells you wow something's happening i don't know what it is but it's something we haven't seen before and um I happen to really like that one, but you know, it's hard for me to say why, except that it's just so different than everything else. You said that this is your favorite, your your first, uh, you know, TV episodic thing to work on, but you also worked on Space Force, which is another sort of strange fit that I wouldn't really call that dark humor necessarily. It's definitely humor. It's Steve Carell, but that's obviously very different. Is that something you enjoyed, and are you involved in in season two for that show? I did enjoy it. It was. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I admired Greg Daniels' work for a long time, and um, that was really why I um, said I would do it. Because half-hour television is, again, if, if something like Morning Show is different than film, half-hour television is even more different because it moves so quickly and um, you have so little time even to establish a concept in, the sh in that episode before it's over and then you're on to the next one, right? But... Um, uh, but early on, Greg and I agreed we wanted to like do an orchestral score, which is unheard of basically for half-hour television. I, the Simpsons did it, but that's about it. <clears throat> and uh, I did really enjoy that. Um, it was, um, again, also like Morning Show, I didn't know where the season was going because they didn't have, I think maybe they had one script when I started it, one or two. Um, and I'm not sure they knew <laughs> where it was going either. That's often the case. Um, but I really did enjoy um, enjoy doing it, uh, although it goes so fast. It's, I'm, you know, by the time when it was over, my head was still spinning like, wow, we just did that. Um, but I'm not actually doing the second season they're, um, they're, they're I think they actually trimmed it down to uh, seven episodes or something. And it's going even so even faster. I, I just can't, you know, can't keep up. 
No, of course. Well, you've done a lot of great work. I've been listening to you for years. Um, I'm a big fan of the uh, Pipes track from Fur. Um, and I think I most closely associate you with the score for the film Fargo and especially for uh, The Roof from uh, A Serious Man. These are just things that I've you know listened to I over and over. Those. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's a good selection. I, I like that. So obviously you've worked with the Coen brothers uh, a lot and you're, you know, you're doing their, their, uh, their next film, which has screened before and is coming out soon, The Tragedy of Macbeth. Um, when you work with the same people over and over again, do you find that you return to familiar styles or you want to sort of challenge yourself to do something new and different each time? You know, it doesn't so much have to do with the people. That really doesn't have that much to do with the 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 styles or um, modes in which I write. It, it, it is about the film, and so the good thing about working with um, the Coens is that they try not to repeat themselves. I mean, they you can you know you definitely know when you're watching. I think a Coen Brothers film, there there's a way of writing and a way of shooting that um, that they have, even if every film is is um, is different but they they don't try to repeat themselves you know and um as an example you know when we were we knew maybe a couple of years in advance that they were going to do true grit but uh and whenever i'd see them we'd, we'd say so what would we do for music because they'd already done folk music and of course there already had been a true grit film with its own sort of hollywood western score and um we tried to find a, a thing that we a, a voice for the music that we hadn't done before and that hadn't been done, you know, before, and um, and I think we did. Um, in the end, my my concept was to go with um, these Protestant hymns, nineteenth century hymns, and and use them as the basis for the score because of the the main characters, you know, um, churchiness. But um, yeah, they're very, you know, they're pretty serious about trying not to repeat themselves, and that's the great thing. So that means that gives me freedom not to repeat myself and and, and to stretch as a, as a composer. So it's it's been a great. Um, a great journey really great and what are some of your favorite film and tv soundtracks that you've been listening to this year well let's see um you know i just saw um don't look up which was uh which um nick Brittell did the music for and it's it's a great film and a great score. I love you know, basically all of Nick's work. He's he's um, he's he's really um, a very talented composer. And I feel like we're we're lucky to have him in this in this business. Um, and uh, let's see what else? Well, and also his his score to um, Underground Railroad that was great. Um, I'm not good at summoning these things up. Uh, oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Moment. That's okay, but um, yeah. I'm I oh oh um Johnny Greenwood score to um, that's called Power of the Dog I think it is oh, yeah. the Jane Campion movie, um is beautiful um, uh, he's another very interesting composer, um those are the ones that come to my mind immediately. Oh, that's great, absolutely. I haven't seen Don't Look Up yet, but the others I I can agree with strongly. And uh, what else do you have coming up next besides uh, the tragedy of Macbeth? Well, I just finished a, a week ago uh, a film with Lena Dunham um, that she wrote and directed. Uh, the title is Catherine Called Birdie, and it's a sort of a young adult. Uh, it's from a young adult book, I guess, probably for a tween and teenage audience. Um, and I did this all vocal score for it that I'm very excited about. I'm partly excited because it's the last thing I did, and I just finished it a week ago. But um, but it. I worked with this group called Room Full of Teeth, and um, and I think it's very distinctive, just because you don't hear that that often in a in a film. So I'm very excited about that one. Okay. It'll come out next come out next year. I don't really know the release date or the plan. Okay, well, I really appreciate you speaking today, and looking forward to hearing what you do next. Well, thank you. It's good talking to you. Thanks so much.